morning the bandages were to be removed, a staff nurse spent half an hour preparing me for Mr. Rice. It wasn't really her job, she told me, but this was my big day and I had to look my best and she was happy to do it. So she sponged my face and hands. She made me clean my teeth again. She wondered, did I use lipstick? Maybe just for today? She did the best she could with my hair, God help her. She looked at my fingernails and suggested that a touch of clear varnish would be nice. She straightened the bow at the front of my nightdress and adjusted the collar of my dressing gown. She put a dab of her own very special perfume on each of my wrists. She got it from a cousin in Paris. And then she stood back and surveyed me and said, No, that's better. You'll find that from now on, if everything goes well, of course, you'll find that you've become very aware of your appearance. They all do for some reason. Don't be nervous. You look just lovely. He'll be here any minute now. I asked her where the bathroom was. At the end of the corridor, last door on the right, I'll bring you. No, I said. I'll find it. I didn't need to go to the bathroom. I just wanted to take, perhaps, a last walk in my own world by myself. I don't know what I expected when the bandages would be removed. I think maybe I didn't allow myself any expectations. I knew that, uh, in his heart, Frank believed that somehow, miraculously, I would be given perfect vision that sighted people have, even though Mr. Rice told us again and again that my eyes weren't capable of that vision. And I knew that what Mr. Rice hoped for, that I would have partial sight. That would be a total success for me, is what he said. But I'm sure he meant it would be great for all of us. As for myself, if I had any hope, I suppose it was neither Frank nor Mr. Rice who'd be too disappointed because it had all become so important for them. No, that's not accurate either. Yes, I did want to see. For God's sake, of course I wanted to see. But that wasn't an expectation. Not even a mad hope. If there was a phantom desire, a fantasy in my head, it was this. That perhaps by some means I might be afforded a brief excursion to this land of vision. And not to live there, just to visit. And during my stay devoured again and again and again with greedy, ravenous eyes. To gorge on all those luminous sights and wonderful spectacles until I knew every detail intimately and utterly. Every ocean, every leaf, every field, every star, every tiny flower. And then yes... Oh, yes, to return home to my own world with all that rare understanding within me forever. No, that wasn't even a phantom desire. Just a stupid fantasy. And <laughs> it came into my head again when that poor nurse was trying to prettify me for Mr. Rice. And I thought to myself, it's like being back at school. I'm getting dressed up for the annual excursion. When Mr. Rice did arrive, even before he touched me, I knew by his quick, shallow breathing that he was far more nervous than I was. And then, as he took off the bandages, his hands trembled and fumbled. There we are, he said. All off. How does that feel? Fine, I said, even though I felt nothing. Were all the bandages off? Now, Molly, in your own time, tell me what you see. Nothing. Nothing at all. And out of the void, a blur, a haze, a body of mist, a confusion of light, color, movement. It, it had no meaning. Well, he said, anything. Anything at all. I thought, don't panic. A voice comes from a face. That blur is his face. Look at him. Well, anything. Something moving, large, white. The nurse had lines, black lines, vertical lines. The bed, the door. Anything, Molly. A bright light that hurt. A window, maybe. I'm holding my hand before your eyes, Molly. Can you see it? A reddish blob in front of my face. Rotating, liquefying, pulsating. Keep calm. Concentrate. Can you see my hand, Molly? I think so. I'm not sure. Now I'm moving my hand slowly. Yes. Yes. Do you see my hand moving? Yes. What way is it moving? Yes. I do see it up and down. Up and down. Yes. I see it. I do. Yes. Moving up and down. Yes. 
Yes, yes. Splendid, he said. Absolutely splendid. You are a clever lady. And there was such delight in his voice. And my head was suddenly giddy, and I, I thought for a moment... For a moment I thought I was going to faint. There was some mix-up about what time the bandages were to be removed. At least, I was confused. For some reason I got it into my head that they were to be taken off at 8 in the morning, October 8th, the day after the operation. A Wednesday, I remember, because I was doing a crash course in speed reading and I had to switch from the morning to the afternoon class for the day. So, eight o'clock sharp, there I was, sitting in the hospital, dickied up. The good suit, the shoes polished, the clean shirt, the new tie. And with my bunch of flowers waiting to be summoned to Molly's ward. The call finally did come, at a quarter to twelve. Ward ten, room seventeen, and of course by then I knew the operation was a disaster. Knocked, went in, Rice was there. And a staff nurse, a tiny little woman, and an Indian man, an anaesthetist, I think. The moment I entered, he rushed out without saying a word. And Molly, sitting very straight in a white chair beside her bed, her hair pulled away back from her face and piled up just here, wearing a lime green dressing gown that Rita Cairns had lent her in the blue slippers I got for her her last birthday. There was a small bruise mark below her right eye. I thought, how young she looks. And so beautiful, so very beautiful. There she is, said Rice. How does she look? She looks well. Well, she looks wonderful, and why not? Everything went brilliantly. A complete success, a dream. He was so excited. There was no trace of the posh accent, and he bounced up and down on the balls of his feet, and he took my hand and shook it as if he were congratulating me. And the tiny staff nurse laughed and said, Brilliant, brilliant, and in her excitement, knocked the chart off the end of the bed and then laughed even more. Speak to her, said Rice. Say something. How are you? I said to Molly. How do I look? You look great. Do you like my black eye? I didn't notice it, I said. I'm feeling great, she said, really. But what about you? What do you mean? Did you manage all right on your own last night? I suppose at that moment and in those circumstances it did sound a bit funny. Anyhow, Rice laughed out loud and of course the staff nurse and then Molly and I had to laugh too. In relief, I suppose, really. Then Rice said to me, aren't you going to give the lady her flowers? Sorry, I said. I got Rita to choose them. She said, they're your favorite. Could she see them? I didn't know what to do. Should I take her hand and put the flowers into it? I held them in front of her. She reached out confidently and took them from me. They're lovely, she said. Thank you. Lovely. And she held them at arm's length directly in front of her face and turned them round. Suddenly Rice said, What color are they, Molly? She didn't hesitate at all. They're blue, she said. Aren't they blue? They certainly are. And the paper, Rice asked. What color is the wrapping paper? Is it... Uh, yellow? Yes, so you know some colors. Excellent, really excellent. And the staff nurse clapped with delight. Now a really hard question, and I'm not sure I know the answer to it myself. What sort of flowers are they? She brought them right up to her face. She turned them upside down. She held them at arm's length again. She stared at them, peered at them, really, for what seemed an age. I knew how anxious she was by the way her mouth was working. Well, Molly, do you know what they are? We waited. Another long silence. Then suddenly she closed her eyes shut tight. She brought the flowers right up against her face and inhaled in quick gulps at the, and at the same time, with her free hand swiftly, deftly, felt the stems and the leaves and the blossoms. Then with her eyes still shut tight, she called out desperately, defiantly, They're cornflowers! That's what they are, cornflowers, blue cornflowers, centauria! And for maybe half a minute she cried. Sobbed, really. The staff nurse looked uneasily at Rice. He held up his hand. Cornflowers indeed. Splendid, he said very softly. Excellent. It has been a heavy day. But we're really on our way now, aren't we? 
I went back to the hospital again that night after my class. She was in buoyant form. I never saw her so animated. I can see, Frank, she kept saying. Do you hear me? I can see. Mr. Rice was a genius. Wasn't it all wonderful? The nurses were angels. Wasn't I thrilled? She loved my red tie. It was red, wasn't it? And everybody was so kind. Dorothy and Joyce brought those chocolates during their lunch break. And old Mr. McNeil sent the get well card. There, look. On the windowsill. And didn't the flowers look beautiful in that pink vase? She would have the operation on the left eye just as soon as Mr. Rice would agree. And then Frank, and then, and then, and then, and then, oh God, what then? I was so happy, so happy for her. Couldn't have been happier for God's sake. But just as on that first morning in Rice's bungalow when the only thing my mind could focus on was the smell of fresh whiskey off his breath, now all I could think of was some... Some, some absurd scrap of information a Norwegian fisherman told me about the eyes of whales. Whales, for God's sake. Stupid information. Useless, offbeat information. Stupid, useless, quirky mind. Molly was still in full flight when a nurse came in and said that visiting time was long over and that Mrs. Sweeney needed all her strength to face tomorrow. How do I look? Great, I said. Really, Frank? Honestly. Wonderful. Black eye and all? You wouldn't notice it, I said. She caught my hand. Do you think... Do I think what? Do you think I look pretty, Frank? You look beautiful, I said. Just beautiful. Thank you. I kissed her on the forehead and as I said goodnight to her, she gazed intently at my face as if she were trying to read it. Her eyes were bright, unnaturally bright, burnished. And her expression was open and joyous, but as I said goodnight, I had a feeling she wasn't as joyous as she looked. When I look back over my working life, I supposed I must have done thousands of operations. Sorry, performed. Bloomstein always corrected me on that. Come on, you bloody bog men. We're not mechanics. We're artists. We perform. And of those thousands, I wonder how many I'll remember. I'll remember Dubai. An Arab gentleman whose left eye had been almost pecked out by one of his peregrines and who sent his private jet to New York for Hans Gerder and myself. The eye was saved, really, because Gerder was a magician. And we spent a week in a palace of marble and gold, and played poker with the crew of the jet, and lost every penny of the ransom we had just earned. And I'll remember a city called Frankfurt in Kentucky, and an elderly lady called Busty Butterfly, who had been blinded in a gas explosion. Hiroshi Matoba and I performed that operation. A tricky one, but he and I always worked well together. And Busty Butterfly was so grateful that she wanted me to have her best racehorse and little Hiroshi to marry her. And I'll remember Balibeg. Of course, I'll remember Balibeg. And the courageous Molly Sweeney. And I'll remember it not because of the operation, the operation wasn't all that complex, nor because the circumstances were special, nor indeed because a woman who had been blind for over forty years got her sight back. Yes, 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 I'll remember it for all those reasons. Of course I will. But the core, the very heart of the memory, will be something different, something altogether different. Perhaps I should explain that after that high summer of my 32nd year, that episode in Cairo, the dinner party for Maria, Bloomstein's phone call, all that tawdry drama, my life no longer cohered. I withdrew from medicine, from friendships, from all the consolations of work and the familiar. And for seven years and seven months, Sounds like a fairy tale I used to read to Isley. I subsided into a terrible darkness. 
but I was talking of Molly's operation and my memory of that. And the core of that memory is this, that for seventy-five minutes in the theater on that blustery October morning, the darkness miraculously lifted, and I performed. I watched myself do it. I performed so assuredly and with such skill, so elegantly, so efficiently, so economically. Yes, 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 of course, it sounds vain. Vanity has nothing to do with it. But suddenly, miraculously, all the gifts, all the gifts were mine again, absolutely, abundantly mine, joyously mine. And on that blustery October morning, I had such a feeling of mastery and, how can I put it, such a sense of playfulness, for God's sake, that I knew I was restored. No, 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 not fully restored. Never fully restored. But a sense that a practical restoration, perhaps a restoration to something truer, that was possible. Yes. Maybe that was possible. Yes, I'll remember Ballybeg. And when I left that dreary little place, that's the memory I took away with me. The place where I restored her sight to Molly Sweeney. Where the terrible darkness lifted. Where the shaft of light glanced off me again. Mr. Rice said he couldn't have been more pleased with my progress. He called me his miracle, Molly. I liked him a lot more as the weeks passed. And as usual, Rita was wonderful. She let me off work early every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'd dress up in this new coat I'd bought, a mad splurge to keep the spirits up, a brilliant scarlet with a matching beret. Rita said I could be seen from miles away, like a distress signal. Anyhow, in all my new style, I'd walk to the hospital on those three afternoons without my cane. <laughs> Sometimes that was scary, I can tell you. And Mr. Royce would examine me and say, Splendid, Molly, splendid. And then he'd pass me on to a psychotherapist, Mrs. O'Connor, a beautiful-looking young woman, according to Frank. And I'd do all sorts of tests with her. And then she'd pass me on to George, her husband, for more tests. He was a behavioral psychologist, if you don't mind. A real genius, apparently. The pair of them were writing a book on me. And then uh, I'd go back to Mr. Rice again, and he'd say, Splendid. Again. And then I'd walk home, still no cane, and have Frank's tea waiting for him when he'd get back from the library. I can't tell you how kind Frank was to me. How patient he was. As soon as tea was over, he'd sit at the top of the table and put me at the bottom and he'd begin my lesson. He'd put something in front of me, maybe a bowl of fruit, and he'd say, What have I got in my hand? <laughs> a piece of fruit? What sort of fruit? An orange, Frank. I know the color, don't I? Very clever. Now what's this? It's a pear. You're guessing. Let me touch it. Not allowed. You already have your tactical engrams. You've got to build up a repertory of visual engrams to connect them. And I'd say, for God's sake, stop showing off your posh new words, Frank. It's a banana. Sorry. Try again. It's a peach, right? Splendid, he'd say in Mr. Rice's accent. It certainly is a peach. Now what's this? And he'd move on to the knives and the forks or the shoes and the slippers or all the bits and pieces on the mantelpiece for maybe another hour or more. Every night. Seven nights a week. Oh, yes. Frank couldn't have been kinder to me. Rita, too. Even kinder. Even more patient. And all my customers at the health club, the ones who had massages regularly, they sent me a huge bouquet of pink and white tulips. And the club I used to swim with, they sent me a beautiful gardening book. God knows what they thought, that I'd now be able to pick it up and read it, but everyone was great. Just great. Oh yes, I lived in a very exciting world for those first weeks after the operation. Not at all like that silly world I wanted to visit in Devar. None of that nonsense. No. The world that I now saw, half saw, peered at, really. It was a world of wonder and surprise and delight. Oh, yes, wonderful, surprising, delightful, and joy. Such joy, small, unexpected joys that came in such profusion and passed so quickly that there was never enough time to savor them. 
It was a very foreign world, too, and disquieting, even alarming. Every color dazzled, every light blazed, every shape an apparition, a specter that appeared suddenly from nowhere and challenged you. And all that movement, nothing ever still, everything in motion all the time, and every movement unexpected, somehow threatening. Even the sudden sparrows in the garden, they seem so aggressive, dangerous. So that after a time, the mind could absorb no more sensation. Just one more color, light, movement, ghostly shape, and suddenly the head imploded and the hands shook and the hearts melted with panic. And the only escape, the only way to live was to sit absolutely still. Shut your eyes tight. Just immerse yourself in darkness. And wait. Then, when the hands were still, and the heart quiet, slowly open the eyes again, and emerge. Try to find the courage to face it all once more. I tried to explain to Frank once how, I suppose, how terrifying it all was. <laughs> but naturally, naturally, he's far more concerned with teaching me practical things. <laughs> And one day, when I mentioned to Mr. Royce that I didn't think I'd find things as unnerving as I did, he said in a very icy voice, And what sort of world did you expect, Miss Sweeney? <laughs> yes, it was a strange time. An exciting time, too. Oh, yes, exciting, but so strange. <laughs> and during those weeks after the operation, I found myself thinking more and more about my mother and father but especially about my mother and what it must have been like for her living in that huge echo in ice. I operated on the second eye, the left eye, six weeks after the first operation. I had hoped it might have been a healthier eye, but when the cataract was removed, we found our retina much the same as in the right. Traces of pigmentosa, scarred macula, areas atrophied. However, with both eyes functioning to some degree, her visual field was larger, and she fixated better. She could now see, from a medical point of view. From a psychological point of view, she was still blind. In other words, she now had to learn to see. As we got closer to the end of that year, it was quite clear that Molly was changing. Had changed. And one of the most fascinating insights into the state of her mind at that time was given to me by Jane O'Connor, the psychotherapist. Very interesting woman. Brilliant, actually. Married to George, a behavioral psychologist, a second writer, if you ask me. And what a bar, what a bar. Do you know what that man did? Lectured me one day for over an hour on cheese making, if you don't mind. Anyhow, anyhow. The two of them, the O'Connors, they were doing this book on Molly, a sort of documentation of her case history. From early sight to lifelong blindness to sight restored to whatever. And the way Jean explained Molly's condition to me was this. All of us live on a swing, she said. And the swing normally moves smoothly and evenly across a narrow range of the usual emotions. Then we have a crisis in our life so that instead of moving evenly from, say, feeling sort of happy to feeling sort of miserable, we now swing from elation to despair, from unimaginable delight to utter wretchedness. The word she used was delivered. To show how passive we are in this terrifying game, we are delivered into one emotional state, snatched away from it, delivered into the opposite emotional state, and we can't help ourselves. We can't escape. Until eventually we can endure no more abuse, becoming capable of experiencing anything, feeling anything at all. That's how Jane O'Connor explained Molly's behavior to me. Very interesting woman. Brilliant, actually. And beautiful, too. Oh yes, all the gifts. And what she said helped me to understand Molly's extraordinary behavior. Difficult behavior, yes, God damn it. Very difficult behavior over those weeks leading up to Christmas. For example, for example, one day out of the blue, a Friday evening in December, five o'clock, I'm about to go to the hikers club and she says, I feel like a swim, Frank. Let's go for a swim now. At this stage, I'm beginning to recognize the symptoms. The defiant smile, the excessive enthusiasm, some reckless, dangerous proposal, 
Fine, fine, I say. Even though it's pitch dark and raining. So we'll go to the swimming pool? Oh no. She wants to swim in the sea. And not only swim in the sea on a wet Friday night in December, but she wants to go out to the rocks at the far end of Tremor and she wants to climb up on top of Napoleon Rock? As we, as we call it locally. It's the highest rock there, a cliff, really. And I'm to tell her if the tide is in or out, or how close are the small rocks in the sea below, and how deep the water is, because she's going to dive, to dive for God's sake, the 80 feet from the top of Napoleon down into the Atlantic Ocean. And why not, Frank? Why not, for God's sake? Oh, yes. <laughs> An enormous change. Something extraordinary about all that. Then there was the night I watched her through the bedroom door. She was sitting at her dressing table in front of the mirror, trying her hair in different ways. When she would have it in a certain way, she'd lean close to the mirror and peer into it and turn her head from side to side. But you knew she couldn't read her reflection. She could scarcely even see it. Then she would try the hair in a different style and she'd lean into the mirror again until her face was almost touching it. And again, she'd turn first to one side and then the other. And you knew that all she saw was a blur. Then after about a dozen attempts, she stood up and came to the door. It was then I could see she was crying. And she switched off the light. Then she went back to the dressing table and sat down again in the dark for maybe an hour. Sat there and gazed listlessly at the black mirror. Yes, she did dive into the Atlantic from the top of Napoleon Rock. First time in her life. Difficult times, so oh, I can't tell you. Difficult times for all of us. The dangerous period for Molly came, as it does for all patients, when the first delight and excitement at having vision have died away. The old world with its routines, all the consolations of work and the familiar, is gone forever. And a sighted world, a partially sighted world, for that is the best it will ever be, is available. But to compose it, to put it together, demands effort and concentration and patience that are almost superhuman. So the question she asked, had to ask herself was, how much do I want this world? And am I prepared to make that enormous effort to get it? Then there was a new development, as if she hadn't enough troubles already, a frightening new development. She began getting spells of dizziness when everything seemed in a thick fog. All external reality became just a haze. This would hit her for no reason at all. At work or walking home or in the house, and it would last for an hour, maybe several hours. Rice had no explanation for it. But you could see he was concerned. It's called gnosis, he said. How do you spell that? J-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Huh. And what is it? It's a condition of impaired vision, Mr. Sweeney. <laughs> he really was a right little bastard at times. Anyhow, I looked it up in the library, and interestingly, interestingly, I could find no reference at all to a medical condition called gnosis. But according to the dictionary, the word meant a mystical knowledge, a knowledge of spiritual things. And my first thought was, good old Molly. Molly's full of mystical knowledge. God forgive me, I really didn't mean to be so cheap. I meant to tell Rice about that meaning of the words next time I met him, just to bring him down a peg. But it slipped my mind. I suppose because the condition disappeared as suddenly as it appeared. And anyway, she had so many troubles at that stage that my skirmishes with Rice didn't matter anymore. Test, 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 test. Between Mr. Rice and Jane O'Connor and George O'Connor and indeed Frank himself, I must have spent months and months being analyzed and answering questions and identifying drawings and making sketches. And God, those damn tests with photographs and lights and objects, those endless tricks and illusions and distortions. It was all their illusion, the Ames distorting room, the staircase illusion, the molar liar illusion, and... They never told you if you'd passed or failed, so you always assumed you'd failed. Such peace. Such peace when they were all finished. We stopped at the florist one evening to get something for Tony and Betty from this side. Well, what was this side? Molly's father and mother for their wedding anniversary. And I spotted this little pot of flowers, like large buttercups, about six inches tall with blue petals and what seemed to me a whitish center. 
I thought I recognized him, but I wasn't quite sure. I wouldn't allow myself to touch him. I'll take days, I said to the man. Pretty, aren't they, he said. Just in from Holland this morning. And you know what? I can't remember what they're called. Do you know? Their name of Fela. Are they? Yes, I said. Feel the leaves. They should be dry and feathery. You're right, he said. That's what they are. They have another name, haven't they? Baby blue eyes, I said. <laughs> That's it, I'd forgotten that. Getting too old for this job. Yes, that gave me some pleasure. One silly little victory. And when I took them home and held them up to my face and looked closely at them, they weren't nearly as pretty as buttercups. Weren't pretty at all. Couldn't give that as a present next door. It was the clever Jane O'Connor who spotted the distress signals first. She said to me, we should be seeing a renaissance of personality at this point. Because if that doesn't take place, and it's not, then you could expect a withdrawal. And she was right. That's what happened. Molly just withdrew. Then in the middle of February, she lost her job in the health club. And now Rita was no longer a friend. And that was so unfair. Rita kept making allowances for her long after any other boss would have got rid of her. Turning in late, leaving early, maybe not even making an appearance for two or three days. Just sitting alone in her bedroom with her eyes shut, maybe listening to the radio, maybe just sitting there in silence. I made a last effort on the 1st of March. I took her new scarlet coat out of the wardrobe and I said, Come on, girl, enough of this. We're going for a long walk on Tremor Beach. Then we'll have a drink in Moriarty's. Then we'll have dinner in that new Chinese place, right? Right. And I left the coat at the foot of her bed. And that's where it lay for weeks and weeks. In fact, she never wore it out again. And at that point, I had come to the end of my tether. There seemed to be nothing more I could do. In those last few months, a new condition appeared. She began showing symptoms of a condition known as blind sight. This is a physiological condition, not psychological. On those occasions, she claimed she could see nothing, absolutely nothing at all. And indeed, she was telling the truth. But even as she said this, she behaved as if she could see. Reach for her purse, avoid a chair that was in her way, lift a book and hand it to you. She was indeed receiving visual signals, and she was indeed responding to them. But because of a malfunction in part of the cerebral cortex, none of this perception reached her consciousness. She was totally unconscious of seeing anything at all. In other words, she had vision but a vision that was utterly useless to her. Blind sight. Curious word. I remember in Cleveland, once Bloomstein and Maria and I were in a restaurant, and when Maria left the table, Bloomstein said to me, Beautiful lady, you do know that. I know, I said. Do you really? I said, of course I did. That's not how you behave, he said. You behave like a man with blind sight. We were in the pub this night, Billy Hughes and myself, just sitting and chatting about... Uh, yes, I remember what we were talking about. An idea Billy had of recycling old tea leaves and turning them into a substitute for tobacco. We should have followed that up. And anyhow, anyhow... This man comes up to me in the bar, says he's a journalist from a Dublin paper, asks would I be interested in giving him the full story about Molly. He seemed a decent man. I talked to him for maybe an hour at most. Of course it was stupid, and I really didn't do it for the bloody money. Jack from next door spotted the piece and brought it in. Miracle cure, false drawn. Molly sulks in darkness, husband drowns sorrows in pub. Of course, she heard about it. God knows how. And now, I was as bad as all the others. I had let her down, too. During all those years when my mother was in the hospital with her nerves, my father brought me to visit her only three times. Maybe that was her choice. Or his. I never knew. But 
I have a vivid memory of each of those three visits. One of the voice of a youngish woman. My father and mother are in her ward, surrounded by a screen fighting as usual, and I'm standing outside in the huge echoey corridor. I can hear a young woman sobbing at the far end of the corridor, more lamenting than sobbing. And even though a lot of people are passing along that corridor, I remember wondering why no one paid any attention to her. For some reason, the sound of that lamentation stayed with me. I remember another patient, an old man leaning over me and enveloping me in the smell of snuff. He slipped a coin into my hand and said, Go out and buy us a fancy new car, son, and the two of us will drive away to a beautiful fettered on sea. And he laughed. He'd given me a shilling. The third memory is of my mother sitting on her side of the bed, shouting at my father, screaming at him. She should be at a blind school. You know she should. But you know the real reason you won't send her? Not because you haven't the money, but because you want to punish me. I didn't tell Mr. Rice about that story when he first asked me about my childhood. Out of loyalty to father, maybe. Maybe out of loyalty to mother, too. Anyhow, those memories came into my head the other day. I can't have been more than six or seven at the time. In those last few months, it was hard to recognize the woman who had first come to my house. The confident way she shook my hand, her calm and her independence, the way she held her head, how self-sufficient she had been then. Her home, her job, her friends, her swimming, so naturally, so easily experiencing her world with her hands alone. And we had once asked so glibly, what is she to lose? In those last few months, I was seeing less and less. I was living in the hospital then, mother's old hospital. What was strange was there were times when I didn't know what the things I could see were real or if I was imagining them. I seemed to be living on a borderline between fantasy and reality. Yes, <laughs> that was a strange state. Anxious at first, oh, very anxious, because it meant that I couldn't trust anymore what sight I still had. It was no longer trustworthy. But as time went on, that anxiety receded. It seemed to be a silly anxiety. Not that I began trusting my eyes again, just the trying to discriminate, to distinguish between what might be real and what might be imagined, being guided by what Father used to call excellent testimony. That didn't seem to matter all that much. <laughs> seemed to matter less and less, and for some reason, the less it mattered, the more I thought I could see. In those last few months, she was living in the psychiatric hospital at that point. I knew I had lost contact with her. She had moved away from us all. She wasn't in her old blind world. She was exiled from that. And the sighted world, which she had never found hospitable, wasn't available to her anymore. My sense was that she was trying to compose another life that was neither sighted nor unsighted, somewhere she hoped was beyond disappointment, somewhere she hoped without expectation. The last time I saw Rice was on the following Easter Sunday, April 7th, six months to the day after the first operation, fishing on a lake called Luau, away up in the hills. Billy Hughes spotted him first. Isn't that your friend, Mr. Rice? Wave to him, man. And what were Billy and I doing up there in the wilds? Embarrassing, but I'll explain. Bollybeg got its water supply from Luana in the summer when the lake was low from two small adjoining lakes. So to make the supply more efficient, it was decided that at the end of April, the two small lakes would be emptied into Luana and it would become the sole reservoir for the town. That would raise the water level of Anna by 15 feet and of course ruined the trout fishing there. Not that that worried them. So in fact, that Easter Sunday would have been Rice's last time to fish there. But he probably knew that because Anna was his favourite lake. He was up there every chance he got. And he had told me once that he had thought of putting a boat on it. Anyhow, anyhow, Billy Hughes and his crazy scheme. He had heard that there was a pair of badgers in a set at the edge of the lake. When Anna was flooded in three weeks' time, they would, have, they would be drowned. They would have to be moved. Would I help him? 
Moved two badgers. <laughs> Wonderful. So why did I go with them? Partly to humor the Egypt, but really, I suppose, really, because that would be our last day together, that Easter Sunday. And that's how we spent it. Digging two bloody badgers out of their set, dug for two and a half hours. Then flung old fishing nets over them to immobilize them, then lifted them into two wheelbarrows, then hauled those wheelbarrows along a sheep track up the side of the mountain. And each of those brutes weighed at least 30 pounds so that we were hauling half a hundred weight of bloody badger meat up an almost vertical mountainside, and then, listen to this, the greatest lunacy of all, then tried to farce them into an old abandoned set halfway up the mountain. Brilliant Billy Hughes. But of course, the moment we cut them out of the nets and tried to push them down the new hole, well, naturally, they went wild, bit Billy's ankle and damn near fractured my arm, and then went careening down the hillside in a mad panic, trailing bits of net behind them. And because they can't see too well in the daylight, or maybe because they're half-blind anyway, stumbling into bushes and banging into rocks and bumping into each other and sliding and rolling and tumbling all over the place. And where did they head for? Of course, of course. Straight back to the old set at the edge of the water. The one we destroyed with all our digging. <laughs> well... What could you do but laugh? <laughs> Hands blistered, bleeding ankle, sore arm, filthy clothes, flung ourselves on the heather and laughed until our sides hurt. And then Billy turned to me and said very formally, Happy Easter, Frank. And it seemed like the funniest thing in the world, and off we went again. What an agent that man was. Rice joined us when we were putting the wheelbarrows into the back of Billy's van. I was watching you from the far side, he said. What in God's name were you doing? Billy told him. Good heavens, he said. Posh as ever. A splendid idea. Always a man for the noble pursuit, Frank. The bastard couldn't resist it, I know. But for some reason he didn't anger me that day. Didn't even annoy me. Maybe because his fishing outfit was a couple sizes too big for him and in those baggy trousers he looked a bit like a circus clown. Maybe because at that moment, after that fiasco with the badgers standing on that shower that would be gone in a few weeks' time, none of the three of us, Billy, Rice, myself, none of the three of us seemed such big shots at that moment. Or maybe he didn't annoy me that Easter Sunday afternoon because I knew I'd probably never see him again. I was heading off to Ethiopia in the morning. We left the van outside Billy's flat and he walked me part of the way home. When we got to the courthouse, I said he'd come far enough. We'd part here. I hoped he'd get work. I hoped he'd meet some decent woman who'd marry him and beat some sense into him. And I'd be back home soon, very soon, the moment I'd started out the economy of Ethiopia. The usual stuff. Then we hugged quickly and he walked away and I looked after him and watched his straight back and the quirky way he threw out his left leg as he walked and I thought, my God, I thought, how much I'm going to miss that bloody man. And when he disappeared round the corner of the courthouse, I thought too, Abyssinia, for Christ's sake, or whatever it's called, Ethiopia, Abyssinia, whatever it's called, who cares what it's called, who gives a damn, <laughs> who in his right mind wants to go there for Christ's sake? Not you, you certainly don't. Then why don't you stay where you are, for Christ's sake? What are you looking for? Oh, Jesus. Roger Bloomstein was killed in an air crash on the evening of the 4th of July. He was flying his plane from New York to Cape Cod, where Maria and he had rented a house for the summer. An eyewitness said the engine stopped suddenly. And for a couple of seconds, the plane seemed to sit suspended in the sky, golden and glittering in the setting sun, and then plummeted into the sea just south of Martha's Vineyard. The body was never recovered. I went to New York for the memorial service the following month. Hiroshi Matoba couldn't come. He'd had a massive heart attack the previous week. So of the four horsemen, the brilliant meteors... There were only the two of us. Hans, now the internationally famous Air Girder, silver-haired, sleek, smiling, and myself. Seedy, I knew, after a bad flight and too much whiskey. Girder asked about Molly. 
He had read an article George O'Connor had written about Mrs. M. in the Journal of Psychology. The inquiry sounded casual, but the smiling eyes couldn't conceal the vigilance. So the vigilance was still necessary, despite the success. Maybe more necessary because of the success. Lucky Patty Rice, he said. The chance of a lifetime. Fell on your feet again. Eh, not as lucky as you, Hans. But it didn't end happily for the lady. Afraid not, I said. Too bad. No happy endings. So she is totally sightless now? Totally. And mentally? Good days? Bad days, I said. But she won't survive. Who's to say? I said. No, no, they don't survive. That's the pattern. But they'll insist on having the operation, won't they? And who's to dissuade them? Let me get you a drink, I said, and I walked away. I watched Maria during the service. Her beauty had always been chameleon. She had an instinctive beauty for every occasion. And today, with her drained face and her dazed eyes, and that fragile body, today she was utterly vulnerable, and at the same time within her devastation, wholly intact and untouchable. I had never seen her more beautiful. When the service was over, she came to me and thanked me for coming. We talked about Aisling and Helga. They were having a great time with her parents in Geneva. They loved it there, and her parents spoiled them. They weren't good at answering letters, but they liked getting mine, even though they were a bit scrappy. They were happy girls, she said. Neither of us spoke Roger's name. Then she took my hand and kissed it, and held it briefly against her cheek. It was a loving gesture. But for all its tenderness, because of its tenderness, I knew she was saying a final goodbye to me. As soon as I got back to Bollybeg, I resigned from the hospital and set about gathering whatever belongings I had. The bungalow was rented, never more than a lodging. So the moving out was simple. Some clothes, a few books, the fishing rods. <sighs> Pity to leave the lakes at that time of year. But the lake I enjoyed most, a lake I had grown to love, it had been destroyed by flooding. So it was all no great upheaval. I called on Molly the night before I left. The nurse said she was very frail. But she could last forever, or she could slip away tonight. It's up to herself, she said, but a lovely woman. No trouble at all. If they were all as nice and quiet. She was sleeping, and I didn't waken her. Propped up against the pillows, her mouth open, her breathing shallow, a scarlet coat draped around her shoulders. The wayward hair that had given her so much trouble now contained in a net. And looking down at her, I remembered. Was it all less than a year ago? I had a quick memory of the first time I saw her in my house, and the phantom desire, the insane fantasy that had crossed my mind that day. Was this the chance of a lifetime that might pull my life together, rescue a career, restore a reputation? Dear God, that opulent fantasy life. And looking down at her, Face relaxed, the wayward hair contained in a net. I thought how I had failed her. Of course, I had failed her. But at least, at least for a short time, she did see men walking as if like trees. And I think, perhaps, Yes, I think she understood more than any of us what she did see. When I first went to Mr. Rice, I remember him asking me, was I able to distinguish between light and dark, and what direction light came from? And I remember thinking, oh my god, he's asking you about profound questions about good and evil and all the source of knowledge about big mystical issues. Careful, don't make a fool of yourself. 
And of course, all the poor man wanted to know was how much vision I had. <laughs> and I could answer him easily now. I can't distinguish between light and dark, nor the direction from which light comes, and I certainly wouldn't see the shadow of Frank's hand in front of my face. Yet, that's all long gone. Even the world of touch has shrunk. No, not that it has shrunk, just that I seem to need much less of it now. And after all that anxiety and drudgery we went through with engrams and the need to establish connections between visual and tactile engrams and synchronizing sensations of touch and sight and composing a whole new world. But I suppose it all had to be attempted. I like this hospital. The staff are friendly and I have loads of visitors. Tony and Betty and the baby, Molly from this side, well, what used to be this side, Delight and odd fire in the house, too, to keep it aired for Frank. And Mary from that side. She hasn't told me yet, but I'm afraid Jack has cleared off. And Billy Hughes, out of loyalty to Frank, every Sunday in his life. God help me. <laughs> God help him. And Rita. Of course, Rita. We never talked about the row we had. That's all in the past. I love her visits. She's all the gossip from the club. Next time she's there, I must ask her to sing Oft in the Stilly Night for me. <laughs> and no crying at the end. And old Mr. O'Neill? Ah! Oh, yes! Dan McGrew himself and Louise Lou, his wife, last Wednesday, she appeared in a crazy green cloche hat and deep purple gloves up to here. Eyeshadow halfway down her cheek and a shocking black woolen dress that scarcely covered her bum. Honestly... He was looking just wonderful, not a day over 40, and he stood in the middle of a ward and did a whole thing for me. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up at the Malamute Saloon. And Lou gazing at him in admiration and glancing at us as if to say, isn't he just the greatest thing ever? And he was. He was. Ugh. Oh, I gave my heart a great lift. And yesterday, I got a letter 27 pages long. Frank, who else? <laughs> it took the nurse an hour to read it to me. Ethiopia is a paradise. The people are heroes. The climate is hell. <laughs> the relief workers are completely dedicated. Never in his life has he felt so committed, so passionate, so fulfilled. They have a special bee out there. The African bee that produces twice as much honey as our bees and is immune to all known bee diseases, even though it has an aggressive nature. He is convinced it would do particularly well in Ireland. Maybe in Leitrim. <laughs> and in his very limited spare time, he's taken up philosophy. It is fascinating stuff. There's a man called Aristotle that he thinks highly of. <laughs> I should read him, he says. And he sent a money order for two pound. I'll write again soon. Mother comes in occasionally. Her pale blue headscarf and muddy wellingtons. Nobody pays much attention to her. She just wanders through the wards. She spent so much time here herself, I suppose she has an affection for the place. She doesn't talk much. She never did. But when she sits uneasily on the edge of my bed, as if she were waiting to be summoned, her face, always frozen in that nervous half-smile, I think I know her better than I ever knew her, and I begin to love her all over again. Mr. Rice came to see me one night before he went away. I was propped up in bed, drifting in and out of sleep, and he stood swaying at the side of the bed for maybe five minutes, just gazing at me. I kept my eyes closed, and then he took both my hands in his and he said, I'm sorry, Molly, sweetie. I'm so sorry. And off he went. I suppose it was mean of me to pretend I was asleep, but the smell of whiskey was suffocating. The night nurse told me that on his way out the front door, he almost fell down the stone steps. And sometimes father drops in on his way from court. And we do imaginary tours at a walled garden and compete with each other in the number of flowers and shrubs each of us can identify. 
I asked him once why he'd never sent me to a school for the blind. And as soon as I asked him, I knew I sounded as if I was angry about it. But I wanted to catch him out. But he wasn't at all disturbed. The answer was simple, he said. Mother wasn't well, and when she wasn't in hospital, she needed my company at home. Even though I couldn't see the expression on his face, his voice was lying. The truth of the matter was he was always mean with money. He wouldn't pay the blind school fees. Once, just once, I thought maybe I heard a youngish woman sobbing quietly at the far end of the corridor. More lamenting than sobbing. But I wasn't sure. When I asked the nurse, she said I must have imagined it. There was nobody like that on our floor. Of course, my little old snuff man must be dead years ago. The man who wanted us to drive to the beautiful fettered on sea. He gave me a shilling. I remember. A lot of money in those days. I think I see nothing at all now. But I'm not absolutely sure of that. Anyhow, my borderline country is where I live now. I'm at home there. Well, at ease there. It certainly doesn't worry me any more that what I think I see may be fantasy, or indeed what I take to be imagined may very well be real. What's Frank's term? External reality. Real, imagined, fact, fiction, fantasy, reality, there it seems to be. And, and it seems to be all right. And why should I question any of it anymore? This radio play production of Molly Sweeney by Brian Friel featured the vocal talents of Belle Reeves, Taylor Ratliff, and Heath Kirkendall. 